Hello, and welcome to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. I am your host for today, Kate Carter. I'm Kylie Colwell. And I'm Holly Spear. And like any other episode, we are just going to jump right into today's story. And I want to say this is a little bit of a different one, not something that I would normally do. This is the mysterious disappearance of Carrie Farber. Carrie Lee Farber was born on November 30th, 1974 in Macedonia, Iowa. Her parents' names are Nancy and Dennis. Nancy, her mom, will come up a bit in the story as well. Carrie had an older brother named Adam and a half-brother who was younger named John. When Carrie was about 18 months old, her parents divorced, but they stayed close friends and fortunately had a really good relationship, and Carrie adores both of them. So this is great, something we don't see in most of our stories. She had a great upbringing, wonderful parents, wonderful family. Carrie's mother, Nancy, actually went on after divorce to marry her old high school sweetheart. His name was Mark, and that happened when Carrie was around six years old. And Carrie absolutely loved her new stepdad, Mark, and she really thrived with having two dads. Carrie lived in Macedonia her whole life. And though we all know or have heard the name Macedonia, it's a country, but it's also like used in ancient times, right? Wasn't it? It's like in the Mesopotamia is what I think of. Ah, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I love the. I don't know why I like the word Macedonia, but I didn't know Macedonia, Iowa New name it, for in the next baby? Ooh, for baby what? Macedonia. Macedonia? <laughs> yeah, so cute. So something I did not know because I did not know Macedonia exists in Iowa. It's a super small town of only about 250 people. Did you grow up in a town of 250 people? No, but I could imagine. Everything I read was like, everybody knew everybody. Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like- Very well. I think my graduating class at high school was like 400 people. And I feel like I knew everybody's name. Yeah. You know, so like, I can't even imagine a town of 250. And for some reason or another, this is just what it's like with small towns is that people tend to stay in Macedonia. So even though they graduate and they're supposed to move on, everybody stays there. I mean, one of the facts is Carrie's great grandparents still lived in Macedonia. So like her whole family tree is there, which kind of makes me a little worried about like dating within the family and stuff like that too. Because wouldn't you think at some point you're going to be related to a lot of people? Uh, You better go outside the town by like 20 miles. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Okay. So Carrie was placed into gifted programs growing up in her school in order to accommodate how smart she was. And in her free time... She would be doing stuff at like local theaters and performing in plays and musicals. She eventually moved away and attended college at the University of Kansas. And that's where she met and began dating a man named Frank. But their relationship was a little rocky. And as soon as they started going downhill in their relationship, Carrie found out that she was pregnant. Unable to continue on, the two of them broke up. Carrie went back home to Macedonia to live with her parents have her baby and continue her education via online classes. So like that all happened while she was in college. On December 10th, 1997, Carrie gave birth to a baby boy who she named Maxwell, Max for short. And even though Carrie was a 23 year old single mom who was in school full time, she was known to be a wonderful mother. But after Max's birth, Carrie's mom, Nancy began to notice that Carrie sometimes had these like horrible anxiety attacks And this was something she never had before, which we all, we all know about anxiety. These anxiety attacks would be accompanied by periods of depression as well. And there were days where like Carrie couldn't even get out of bed. At some point, Carrie was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and she was able to get on some medications to help her. But even though the meds helped her mother, Nancy, like did not feel like Carrie was bipolar. In fact, she thought that the doctor who diagnosed Carrie was wrong. No other doctor had even mentioned that idea of bipolar disorder before, so it kind of seemed like the doctor was just trying to give her medications. She also never went through a manic period or a manic episode. Throughout the rest of her 20s, Carrie would bounce around from jobs. She also got married and divorced twice, and she even spent a few years living with her son, Max, in Topeka, Kansas, before moving back to Macedonia with him. At some point, she got her dream job of becoming a computer programmer 
at a company that was located in Omaha, Nebraska. And so that was in 2012. In Omaha is where she met a man named Dave Krupa. So David Alexander Krupa is going to be our next guy in the story, was born on October 9th, 1976 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. His parents were named Trish and Tom, and Dave had two younger brothers named Adam and Max. Dave's father, Tom, worked at a local printing company, and his mother, Trish, worked as a veteran service officer. Overall, the Krupa family were a hardworking, normal family. They were also pretty religious and attended church three times a week at their local Southern Baptist church. But however, the Krupa boys grew up and seemed to not really hold on to religion as much as their parents, and as they got older, they became less religious. But once again, just like Carrie, Dave seemed to have a happy childhood, which again, like I cannot, like makes me happy when I was writing this story about how like normal they were growing up because we obviously tend to see the opposite. After graduating high school, Dave moved to Denver, Colorado, shout out Denver, where he spent two years serving in the National Guard. He also got an associate's degree in automotive engineering before moving back to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But at some point, Dave went on and moved to Council Bluffs, Iowa. So that's going to be his kind of final place in this story is in Council Bluffs. So in Council Bluffs, he worked at a local truck stop. There, he fell in love with one of his coworkers named Amy Flora. Dave and Amy ended up dating for 10 years and having two children together. Amy always wanted to get married, but Dave was really never into the idea. So the couple ended up breaking up in 2011 The split was not amicable, but the two decided to stay civil so that they could easily co-parent their kids. In the rest of the story, Amy doesn't really pop up too much until the end, but I'm going to call her his ex-wife because that's going to make just a little bit more sense as the story goes on. Just they were also together for so long. They were basically married, even though he didn't want it. In 2012, Dave moved out of town, but not too far away to Omaha, Nebraska. And so that was a town over from where Amy and the kids were in Council Bluffs, Iowa. At some point, Dave decided to create an online dating profile on, wouldn't you guess it, the website Plenty of Fish. Love it. Which one is that? Is that just like a normal one? It was like the OG dating website. Ah. Like, like, right? Isn't that 2012, 2010? You were trying to find somebody online. What was, what's that big website that match match? It's like the other Um, match. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like plenty of fish was like Tinder before Tinder. So Dave created this profile and he began chatting with a woman named Liz. So at this point, Dave was 35 years old working as a mechanic. And when he met Liz, she was 38 years old and also had two kids of her own. They went out on their first date and grabbed coffee together in Omaha. Dave told Liz that he had just got out of a long-term relationship and he wasn't looking for like anything serious, but Liz didn't mind this because she was busy with her kids and had a housekeeping business that she ran. So over the next few weeks, the pair began dating and Dave was quick to notice how like how big and how much Liz was into him. He thought she was attractive and fun to be around, but at some point he found that Liz was overwhelming and he eventually lost his interest. Hmm. He he also stated that Liz wasn't really smart or quote unquote worldly and that she was very clingy and into his business. Poor so Liz. Liz just wants to be loved. Yeah. After their breakup, Dave went back into the dating website world and started going out on more dates with other women, having casual hookups, nothing serious. But him and Liz would still occasionally talk and meet up. Dave made it very clear to Liz that he wasn't looking for anything serious. He didn't want to be in a relationship and that he was seeing other people. And Liz seemed to not have an issue with this. At first, everything was going smoothly until Liz started showing up at Dave's apartment. She would show up at his apartment when he was about to leave for some of his dates. So it was like kind of timed. I was about to say, I bet Liz did not take that as well as she too hot, especially if she's quote unquote clingy. Liz would say things to Dave like he was the only person for her and that she had deleted her dating app after they had met. But Dave continued to tell Liz that he didn't want to date her and that she was wasting her time. Oh, I feel bad for her. Mm. I know this story and you shouldn't. Okay, yeah. okay. So far she seems sad, but yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So 
Liz obviously did not want to stop seeing Dave and they, for some reason, continue to meet up and Dave would sleep with her. So like, you know, he's putting out the effort too. Whenever Dave would return home from visiting his kids in Council Bluffs, Liz would be waiting for him outside of his apartment back in Omaha. She would accuse Dave of going to Council Bluffs to hang out with his ex-wife, Amy. But in reality, Dave and Amy weren't on good terms and only communicated when it came to their kids. So Dave eventually got fed up with Liz and decided to break things off for good. But somehow Liz would just continue to seduce Dave and bring him back into her life. This is such a guy story, by the way, just to like, if you're not already getting that vibe, like Dave can't help himself. There was even one point that Dave had blocked Liz's phone number because of how many times she would call or text him. And during the periods that her number was blocked, Liz would resort to sending Dave emails. In these emails, she would try to persuade him or guilt him into getting into a relationship with her. And somehow these emails worked because after a while, the two decided to be exclusive for a month. But I like that there's like a a goal, like one month only. Like, Liz, this is what you get. You get one month. There were guidelines? Yes. He did not (laughs) renew his subscription. No, not at all. (laughs) On one of the days during Liz and Dave's relationship, Dave was working at an auto shop when a woman named Carrie Farver brought her car in for a repair. The two of them spoke for a while about the repairs and what needed to happen. And it was at that time that Dave felt an instant connection with Carrie. She was beautiful. She seemed to be flirting with Dave, but he obviously didn't want to ask out a client at work. So he just dropped the idea, which is funny enough because later on he found Carrie on Plenty of Fish. They connected on Plenty of Fish and began chatting. And just as Dave was finishing his exclusive month with Liz, Carrie brought her car back into the da- into Dave's shop, the two exchange numbers, and planned on meeting up at an Applebee's in Omaha for a date. I'm glad that he didn't ask her out while he was at work. Can you imagine just going to have your car worked on? Like, that would be the most annoying thing ever, you know? You're like, just fix my car, dude. Yeah, I'm just trying to, like, get through my day. But I don't know if he's nice for dragging Liz along. Yeah. Yeah, true. He should, like, know that she's crazy and that it just get makes her worse, maybe. Yeah. So Dave and Carrie hit things off. Dave thought Carrie was perfect for him as she was beautiful, smart, had a good job, and she made him laugh. But in the middle of that Apple Speeds date, Liz started blowing up Dave's phone with texts and calls about wanting to grab her things from his place. Dave tried to ignore these messages because he was on the date, but at some point, just to make them stop, he texted Liz that he was out and she would have to wait until the following day. Eventually, dinner finished and Dave and Carrie headed back to Dave's apartment to spend some more time together chatting and getting to know each other. But all of a sudden, Dave's apartment buzzer started going off and it wouldn't stop. And when Dave went to go to the front door to see who was there, you wouldn't believe it. It was Liz. She was crying and screaming for Dave to let her in. Dave immediately went back in to Carrie and said, hey, my ex is here. She's throwing a fit outside. I just need to take care of the situation. Good enough for Carrie, which blows my mind. She was okay with all of this. She understood that these things happen. And she told Dave to give her a call later. So Dave walked Carrie out of the building. And that's when Liz saw Carrie for the first time. Liz immediately ran upstairs, pushing back Carrie, grabbed her things and left. Since it didn't take Liz too long to leave, Dave called Carrie, who then invited him to her house in Macedonia. Dave ended up spending the night there at Carrie's place. And the two ended up seeing each other for for a few times over the next few weeks. So it turns out Carrie's house in Macedonia and her work in Omaha is a pretty long drive. Dave's apartment in Omaha is is near her work. So Carrie would often just crash at Dave's place to reduce her commute time. Plus, they enjoyed seeing each other and being in each other's company. And they seemed to like really hit it off. But at the same time, Liz was still desperately trying to get Dave back into her life. She would be sending him constant text, voicemails, emails, basically on a daily basis. So then on the night of November 10th, 2012, Dave and Carrie leave Dave's apartment to find Carrie's car vandalized. Her Ford Explorer had been keyed and had silver spray paint all over it. But once again, Carrie didn't really take too much of it into heart and played it off, which like good for her. Wow. I'd be like, call the police. Get the, get the cameras, you know, like recordings. I'd be flipping shit. Yeah. I'd be flipping shit when I was out with a guy on a first date and his ex-girlfriend showed up 
kicking and screaming. I wouldn't be having a second date. No. No. Because I'd be like, why is this girl kicking and screaming? Why is her stuff still at your apartment? Like, I would feel like that he was still leading her on. Like, if I was the girl, you know, and she showed up, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you're still with your ex, obviously. Yeah. And then your car gets vandalized at his apartment complex. And you're like, "Mm, it's fine. The car gets vandalized. Two days later, Carrie spends the night at Dave's place again. She needed to be at work pretty early the next morning. So the next morning comes along. And Dave recalls seeing Carrie sitting on the couch working on her laptop around 6 a.m. She needed to be at work around 6.30. Around 6.30, Dave left for work. She Carrie was still inside. So he gave Carrie a kiss goodbye and said he would see her later tonight. So that day, Carrie ended up not showing up for work. And at 6.42 a.m., Carrie's computer logged out of her Facebook page. And then at 9.54 a.m., her cell phone logged back into Facebook and removed Dave as a friend. And then around that same time, Carrie's Facebook account responded to her own video post on Facebook about her vandalized car. The comment said that the vandalism turned out to be some kids. So when her car was vandalized, she went on Facebook and made a video about like how her car was vandalized, but was it was kind of joking, like not a big deal, like look what happened. And so the day that she didn't show up for work, she wrote a car- comment on her own account that said it was just kids. Hmm. 20 minutes later, Dave got a surprising text from Carrie saying that they should move in together. Obviously, this came off very surprising to Dave because him and Carrie had just talked about not taking things too seriously and that the pace they were going at was just fine. Dave immediately texted back that he didn't want to and Carrie's phone texted back the following quote, fine, I hate you. I'm dating someone else. I don't want to see you anymore. Go away, end quote. Quite the 180 from let's move in together. Yeah. Yeah. A little crazy, right? Around the same time that these text messages were happening, Carrie's supervisor at work was starting to get confused because this was an important day for them. And Carrie was never late and never skipped work either. The supervisor called Carrie's phone multiple times, but all she got was voicemail. Once Dave arrived home from work later that day, he saw that all of Carrie's things were packed and gone. But since he received those weird texts earlier in the day, he just assumed that Carrie had left and didn't want to see or talk to him anymore. That same afternoon, Carrie's mom, Nancy, received a text from Carrie saying that she had found a new job, had moved out of Dave's place, which Nancy found to be odd since she knew Carrie absolutely loved her job. So multiple days had passed and no one saw or heard from Carrie. When Nancy didn't hear from her daughter, she continued to call her, but kept getting to her voicemail. And at one point, Nancy did receive a few texts from Carrie saying that she was thinking about checking into a hospital and that she had just broken up with her boyfriend. And then there was another text saying that she was moving to Kansas with Dave. Texts that didn't make sense at all. Something's not right. Yeah. And then on that Friday, just a few days after not having seen Carrie, Nancy reported her missing to the cops. But the cops didn't pay too much attention to this because they said she was an adult. She had probably ran off after the breakup and was going to return soon. When Nancy reported Carrie missing, she did mention to the cops that Carrie had been diagnosed as bipolar like a while ago. And so, of course, the cops like they were like, she's having an episode, even though she's never had an episode. Not to mention Carrie had her son Max at home, who obviously was like her pride and joy. And Carrie's mom, Nancy, knew that she was never just going to up and leave Max. Not only that, but Carrie's brother, John, was also getting married that weekend. And everyone knew that Carrie would not have missed that wedding for the world. And then on top of all of that, Carrie's dad, Dennis, was battling stomach cancer and he was kind of on his last leg. No one really knew how much time he had left and she really cherished her dad. So there's no way that Carrie would have just disappeared on her own. But that wedding weekend came and went with no sign of Carrie. Meanwhile, Dave had also been receiving weird texts from Carrie ever since she had seemingly moved out of his apartment. The texts that he was receiving were really angry and didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Not to mention they were full of grammar and spelling mistakes, which Carrie never texted that way. I mean, she was a computer programmer. She was used to spelling things right, I guess, you know, like... Okay, so Dave's getting texts, and some of these texts would call Dave horrible names and say that she hated him, while the next day Dave would receive texts from Carrie's number saying she actually loved him and missed him. But weird enough, a lot of the texts that Dave received were actually about Liz. Those texts would call her ugly and fat and say that she was never good enough for Dave. And at the same time, Liz was also getting texts from Carrie. No idea how she got her number, 
but telling Liz that she needed to back off from Dave and that Carrie would threaten to hurt Liz and her kids. So one day Liz called the police and reported that someone had broken into her garage, stating that the person stole one of her invalid checkbooks and had spray painted the word Dave all over her walls. Then on the night of November 17th, five days after her disappearance, Carrie's mom, Nancy, got a text from Carrie. It was a picture of Liz's old checkbooks that had been missing, and one of them was written out for $5,000 and made out to Carrie. The text said that Carrie had sold her bedroom set and that she needed Nancy to let the buyer into the house to get it. Of course, Nancy couldn't believe it because that bedroom set in question was actually a family heirloom, and Nancy knew that Carrie wasn't just going to like sell it on her own. So that's when Nancy firmly decided that this was not Carrie sending the text messages. So Nancy decided to respond to the person saying, quote, I need to hear your voice first so that I know it's really you, end quote. And out of nowhere, Nancy began receiving a string of really angry texts from Carrie saying that Nancy was controlling and a horrible mother and to leave her alone. These texts were also filled with a bunch of grammar mistakes. Nancy takes her phone to the police the next day to show them the texts. But obviously the police weren't convinced. So now it's been a week since Carrie was last seen. Her work supervisor got a text that she was quitting her job and moving to Kansas. That same day, the police tracked down Liz to talk about the missing checks and the photo that was sent from Carrie's phone with Liz's checks. Liz told the police that she was pretty sure Carrie had stolen them and she thought Carrie had actually been stalking her and Dave. But when the investigators looked into Carrie's phone records, it showed that her text messages had been sent from the same neighborhood that Liz lived in. So they went to search for Carrie there, but didn't find her or her car. When the police went on to interview Dave, he told them that ever since Carrie had left, he was receiving hundreds of text messages from her that were threatening and harassment. Can you even imagine? Yes. And I'm like, you're just now saying something to the police. Yeah. 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 So later that day, after Dave's interview was done, one of the investigators received a text message from Carrie telling them to leave Dave out of the investigation. He had nothing to do with it. The investigators responded to the text by telling Carrie that the case would be closed once they talked to her in person. Carrie then texted them back, telling them to leave her alone and that she wanted only one person to go away for destroying everything. At this point, the police were very convinced that Carrie wasn't missing. And that, in fact, she was just a jealous stalker who had gone crazy over Dave and Liz's relationship. But at some point, Dave did get really sick of it. He was receiving over 150 text messages a day from Carrie's phone. And sometimes they would come in so quickly that his phone would, like, automatically shut off. He hasn't blocked the number yet? (laughs) At some point, Dave tried changing his phone number (laughs) and even his email address. But the messages continued to come through. Carrie kept finding a new way to get his information. And most of these messages, again, were just threats full of anger and included things like telling Dave she was going to kill Liz and her children so that they could run away together. There were other texts where Carrie was professing her love for Dave and saying how easy it would be just to get rid of Liz. And weird enough, because this is just really fucking weird at this point, all of this brought Dave and Liz closer together. Dave felt really bad that he had dragged Liz into this Carrie nightmare and often would console Liz on the threatening messages. But Liz didn't seem to mind because she obviously loved the attention from Dave and she was able to be there for him as a sense of comfort. This is, it should all be piecing together at this point, people, okay? But it just, it gets worse. Liz was someone who could understand what Dave was going through because if you remember, Liz was also getting these messages. There would be times where Liz and Dave would be hanging out together where they'd both get a message from Carrie at the same time. So it was obvious that like Carrie was watching them from a distance. In the end of December, Dave got a text from Carrie saying that she was pregnant. And at the same time, Liz got a text saying back off for the sake of the baby. But Dave knew that he had not gotten Carrie pregnant because he had had a vasectomy a while ago and Carrie had had a hysterectomy before they met. So like neither of them could get each other pregnant. But Liz begged for Carrie to leave her alone and even said that she would stop seeing Dave if that meant Carrie's harassment would end. But the messages just kept coming for months and months. Dave tried to ignore these texts and not think so much about them. But the ones that did bother him were the ones where he felt as Carrie was watching him. For example, he would be sitting in his living room chair and he would get a text from Carrie saying, quote, I see you in the chair. 
your feet are propped up and you're wearing a blue t-shirt, end quote. Like what a text. But if I received something like that from someone who had been stalking me, I would have been like, absolutely not. Yeah. Like they're in my house, you know, like how do you, your windows are closed, you know? Mm -hmm. Calling the police immediately. Police, 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 police. But when he would get those kind of creepy texts, he would frantically look around his house and outside, but he would never be able to find Carrie. To make it even worse, Amy, Dave's ex-wife with the children, was also getting harassed. She would get scary texts from Carrie threatening for her to stay away from Dave and not talk to him. But like, what the hell did Amy do? You know, like she's not even, she doesn't even talk to Dave anyways. You know, she's just like, I unfortunately share kids with this man. On November 29th, 2012, Carrie's mom and stepdad, Nancy and Mark, became the legal guardians of Max, Carrie's son. Nancy was devastated having to go through the courtship process, but she really didn't think she had any other options. And then Carrie's 38th birthday came and went, and there were still no signs of her. And because Carrie's birth father, Dennis, was very sick and his health was rapidly declining, Nancy and Mark actually told, like, chose to not tell him about Carrie's disappearance because they thought, you know, that would make it worse. But at some point, he realized that Carrie wasn't visiting him anymore. And so mm-hmm. they decided to break the news to him. Absolutely heartbreaking. Dennis actually ended up passing away a few days later from the news from stomach cancer. A few days later, it was Max's 15th birthday and still no word from his mom. On December 12th, Dennis's funeral was held and people thought for sure Carrie would show up to say her goodbyes, but again, nothing. But Carrie's Facebook page did post a status about her being sorry for missing the funeral. So get this, okay. After Dennis had passed, his ex-wife, Nancy, had a vivid dream one night. And in that dream, Dennis visited her and said, quote, she's with me, end quote. The next morning, Nancy woke up and just had a gut feeling that her daughter, Carrie, had passed away. Obviously, Nancy was hoping that her daughter was going to come back home, that she was missing, or she would be found alive. But this dream actually ended up giving her some sense of peace, which really hurts my heart. So on January 6, 2013, Nancy logged onto her Facebook page, and there she found a new message from an unknown profile. This profile was using Carrie's face and name, but they weren't friends on the app. And Nancy messaged back the profile and said that the only way she would believe it was her daughter is if she could hear her voice. And the account did message back, but angrily and said, quote, fine, I will call you, but I'm done after that. You have Max and I am grateful, but after all the cop stuff from before, I am done. I am not 10 years old, mom. I can leave him and move on with someone new. Everything is about a phone call, but I was just about to head to bed. Who else would know about dad, but fine, I'll call you sometime. I just wanted to let you know that I was okay, end quote. In this message, there was a lot of spelling and grammar issues. So once again, Nancy was suspicious that it wasn't her daughter typing. And also, like, what the, like, what kind of message is that? Like, I don't have time to call you, but I can type out this lengthy message. Right. I'm about to head to bed. But like, you a bitch. Also, yeah. this is just so sad for this mom because it's like, even though you said she got like some peace from that dream, knowing that she might not be alive anymore or it probably isn't. It's just like, it's so sad because you would want to think that she was still alive. Right. And so somebody bad. and like her name and picture and text messages are still coming through. So sad. If, if for some reason Cameron passed away, but someone was using his phone, I would die. Like that would be horrific. That is be awful. Yeah. So at the same time, Carrie's Facebook page had posted an update that, that Dave Krupa had proposed to her. And it had a picture attached with someone's hand with a wedding ring on it. But Nancy could tell from the picture that it wasn't Carrie's hand. As Carrie's fingers were slim and long, these fingers were short and stubby. So Nancy forwarded the post to Dave and waited for his response. Obviously, Dave messaged back and said, no, he did not propose to Carrie and that he had not seen her since she had left and that he had also gotten a pretty scary email the night before. So in this email from Carrie, there was a photo of what appeared to be a woman tied up in the back of a car trunk with duct tape over her mouth. Dave couldn't tell from the picture who the woman was, 
but in the email, it claimed that the woman was Liz and that Carrie was the abductor. In the email, Carrie demanded that Dave break up with Liz, otherwise she was going to kill her. And Dave, for some stupid reason, decided this email was a joke, ignored it, and went to bed. Never called the cops or anything. These people are just pissing me off. That's really annoying. Also, the cops are pissing me off, too, because, like, just track where the message is coming from. Like, do a little bit of work, and you probably could figure something out. I mean, we are figuring it out. Right. Yeah. So the next morning, Dave texted Liz and said that Carrie was being crazy, and Liz responded saying that she was she had not been kidnapped and that Dave was sweet for checking in on her. A few days after this message, Dave actually saw a Ford Explorer in his apartment complex, and for a second, he thought it was Carrie's. But he noticed that the car was covered in snow, meaning it hadn't been driven for days. So Dave decided to let the police know about the car anyways. Good job, Dave. So proud of you this time. A forensic investigator came out to the apartment complex and checked the car for evidence. Inside the car, it looked like it had been wiped clean. The investigator was only able to recover a single fingerprint, which was found on the top of an empty mint tin located in one of the cup holders. But unfortunately, when the cops ran the fingerprint through their database, there was no match, which I also want to say something about this, because this is like in a lot of stories and you hear this all the time when there's no match to fingerprints, your fingerprints are, are they, they're only in the system if you get in trouble, right? Yeah. 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 So like every time it's like there was no match to the fingerprints. Okay. Well, congrats there. That person wasn't a criminal then, you know, like that's, I think about that all the time that I wish like the fingerprint, they get fingerprinted at birth. Why aren't, why don't those just go in? Your fingerprints don't change. Right. Do you want the government to have all of our fingerprints? No, but for over my dead purposes, dead pod purposes, that would be nice. You know, like it would solve a lot of cases, but yeah, it would solve a lot of cases if the government had our fingerprints, but no, they should not. Anyways, so the forensic investigator also saw a small light pink stain located on the passenger seat, but the investigator chalked it up to it just being a spill. At this point, Dave and Liz are starting to get rid of Carrie's text messages, which like shocked they lasted this long. They decided to let the police do a phone dump. During the phone dump, a police connect like a device to your phone and it downloads all of the contents. But it's super important to note note that during the specific phone dump, the police did not scan for any deleted data. They just were doing like whatever data is currently on the phone, which is stupid. After this phone dump, Dave, once again, was starting to get tired of Liz. It seems like she was back to like her normal obsessive bullshit. And she was sending him long texts and being passive aggressive and just really trying to get his attention. But Dave had felt so bad that what he was putting Liz through with all the Carrie stuff. So he decided that every Wednesday they would meet up to have a date. Like, I don't get this. I don't get this whole Dave and Liz thing. I get that he feels bad for like bringing Carrie into Liz's life. But like Liz is crazy. I don't think he has a backbone. No, I think he's just a dude wanting sex. February came around at this point and Liz called the police twice to report that her car had been vandalized. And then on April 1st, she called again to report that someone had keyed the phrase, quote, whore, stop seeing Dave, end quote, into her car. Jeez. Whore, stop seeing Dave, which like they weren't really seeing each other anyways on april 17th carrie's mother nancy received a call from someone claiming to be dave on this phone call he said that carrie had called him and told him that she was at a homeless shelter in omaha nancy immediately hung up the phone called the police they went together to omaha to find that carrie was not indeed at the homeless shelter so when the police asked dave about the phone call he had no idea what they were talking about less than a month later carrie's son max worked up the courage to send his mom's Facebook account a message. After sending the word hi to the account, it quickly responded with, quote, hey, little man, how are you? End quote. Carrie never called her son little man, not to mention he was almost 16 years old now. Max being confused at the response, he decided to send back some questions like, what's my middle name? What was the name of our first dog? Who was my best friend growing up? But of course, the account decided to then not respond to him. So some time had passed without any communication from Carrie and occasionally Dave would date like a new woman here and there, but almost always these women would end up getting threatening messages from Carrie. 
there was this one woman that Dave was talking to on the dating website. Like they hadn't even met in person. And this woman got a private message saying Carrie was going to slit her throat beyond red flags for seeing a guy. On August 17th, 2013, around 8 a.m. in the morning, Liz called 911. Someone had broken into her house and set it on fire. When the firefighters arrived, they went inside the house. This is so sad. And sadly found the bodies of all of Liz's pets. It was two dogs, one cat, and a snake. All four of the animals had died from smoke inhalation. The firefighters and police immediately began their investigation into what could have started the fire and found that someone had intentionally started multiple fires in different rooms of Liz's house. When questioned by the firefighters, Liz immediately stated that Carrie is the one that started the fires because she had been, quote, stalking me, end quote. Liz even showed the police an email from Carrie stating, I hope you and your kids burn to death, end quote. A few days later, Carrie emailed Liz again, this time stating she had indeed been the one that set her house on fire. And right before the fire had occurred, Liz and Dave had actually like parted ways. So like Dave finally broke up with her for like good. And then after the fire, Liz did call Dave and said Carrie had burned her house down and killed her pets. So of course, Dave felt really bad once again and ended up leaving his work early to go see Liz. So throughout the rest of 2013, the harassment from Carrie continued, but everyone seemed to be used to it at this point. There had been texts, email communications, car vandalisms, a house caught on fire, and even bricks were being thrown through windows. But Carrie was actually never seen in person. And what's crazy is that this all continued throughout 2014 as well. So like she she disappeared in 2012. This is a long time to be putting up with this. Yes. We have two detectives, Detective Ryan Davis and Detective Jim Doty. They decided to take a new look at Carrie's disappearance case. So they decided they were going to try something new. Detective Davis was going to look through Carrie's files as if she was still alive. And Detective Doty was going to look through the files as if she was dead. And then the detectives decided that they kept seeing one name come up a little too often in all of their examinations. And that was Liz just kept coming back to Liz. And there was two like many coincidences at this point, right? When the detectives decided to take a deep dive into investigating her, she actually walked into the sheriff's office. So on December 4th, 2015, Liz stated that she wanted to file a harassment report and restraining order against Dave's old wife, Amy Flora. Liz stated that Amy was stalking her on Facebook and she believes that Amy had stolen one of Dave's new guns. Liz even went on to tell the sheriffs that she now believed Amy was the one harassing her and Dave and Carrie's family and that it was never Carrie all along and that Amy was filled with jealousy over Liz and Dave Dave's on and off again relationship. That's when the sheriff asked Liz if she knew what kind of gun had gone missing. And right away, she answered that it was a nine millimeter. And then she quickly stated that she only knew this because she had seen it once or twice in the box in his apartment. Liz even said that she had a bunch of threatening texts from Amy to prove it. And then she allowed the sheriff's department to download her phone contents. But this time, the sheriff's department, unlike the police department, did a phone dump of all of Liz's data on her phone and included the deleted data as well. Liz did not know that was possible. She was, she didn't know that they could get deleted data. And she was shooketh to say the least. She was shooketh. While the downloading was happening, uh, shit even got even like it got worse. It got worse. It got worse. So the next day, because the download takes a while, apparently, The next day at 6.41 p.m., Liz called 911, screaming into the phone, saying that someone had shot her. Here's the 911 recording. 911, what's the address of your emergency? I've been shot in the leg. Where are you in the park, ma'am? I'm in one of the parking lots on the um, left-hand side. I have a little red Toyota, and I'm laying next to it. Okay. Is the assailant still nearby? I don't think so. I took off running. How many people were there? Oh, I, I don't know. I only heard one. Do you know if it was male or female? It was female. Is there more than one wound? Um, I think it was one. They shot off a couple of shots. They only hit one, I think. <laughs> oh, my, my feet are like a soap of blood. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> 
So when officers arrived to the scene, they found Liz on the ground next to her car, bleeding, of course. Liz had been shot in her left thigh. What in the world kind of placement is that? When the cops asked her who had shot her, she said she didn't know. And then a few seconds later, she yelled out, Amy, Amy Flora shot me. Liz then went on to recall sitting on a bench at the park, just minding her own business. When Amy, Dave's ex-wife, appeared out of nowhere from behind and said, quote, so you like fucking Dave, end quote, and then shot her in the leg and ran off. I believe it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you like fucking Dave? (laughs) So the police still did their due diligence and they searched the surrounding area, but they were not able to find any trace of Amy Flora or a shooter in general. Around 7 p.m., Amy heard a banging on her front door, and when she opened it, she was surrounded by police with their guns drawn. The police stated that Liz had been shot and had told them that Amy was the one who shot her. Obviously, Amy had no idea what the hell they were talking about and even stated that she would take a polygraph test to prove that she didn't do anything. I don't even need to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Don't take the polygraph test. So, of course... Amy took the polygraph test and she answered all of the questions honestly. And what happened, ladies? She still failed. Oh, no. But despite fa- failing the polygraph test, the police somehow quickly cleared Amy of any wrongdoings. She had a pretty good alibi. So at that same time that all of this is happening, the shooting and all, an investigator with the sheriff's department, special deputy Tony Cava, was examining the contents of Liz's phone through the phone dump. But this time they found tens of thousands of messages that were being sent by Liz. These messages were being sent through texting apps, fake email accounts. It also, they found incriminating photos, the whole, like the whole shebang. It was beyond obvious that Liz had been impersonating Carrie Farver this entire time. There were even pictures of Liz staging her own kidnapping. There were pictures of Carrie's car before the police had discovered it. There were even photos of a shower curtain that Liz had bought using Carrie's credit card. Special Deputy Cava was tracking dozens of email addresses, Facebook accounts, and cell phone numbers that had been used to stalk Dave all to Liz's phone. He ended up spending extra unpaid hours putting all of this together due to the sheer amount of information that was found on Liz's phone through her deleted data. He even put together a perfect timeline of events through what came off of Liz's cell phone. The detective went on later to say that the amount of time it would have taken Liz to pull this off would have been 40 to 50 hours a week. Jeez. So like more than a full-time job. I'm going to take a little break in the story to tell you guys more about Liz. Liz was born Shauna Collier. She was born in a place called Kalamazoo, Michigan on June 28th, 1975. But when Liz was two years old, social services came and took her and her siblings away from her parents. Liz's mom was a really sweet woman, but had an abusive boyfriend. Liz's mom at some point kicked out the boyfriend. And that's when social services agreed to give her back to give back her children. A year later, when Liz was three years old, her mom was hit and killed by a car. For some reason or another, like we don't know, social services didn't allow the mom's relatives to adopt Liz and her siblings. So they ended up going into foster care and it was in foster care that Liz was reportedly abused by multiple families growing up. At some point she was adopted by the Golier family in Battle Creek, Michigan. They're the ones that changed her name from Shanna to Liz. In 1997, Liz began dating a man named Raymond and quickly became pregnant that same year. But Ray, as he was called, was suspicious that Liz had been cheating on him with her 21-year-old roommate named Glenn. On August 25th, 1998, Liz gave birth to her son named Cody Nathaniel. And after Cody was born, Liz ended up leaving Ray for Glenn. So like, you know, whose who's kid is it anyways? Here's, here's the kicker though. Her new boyfriend, Glenn, was actually mentally handicapped and had a learning disability. And Liz was fully aware of... <laughs> Liz was fully aware of all of this. It was like she was preying on Glenn, to be honest. So Liz quickly moved into Glenn's place, which was his mom's house. His mother's name was Gloria. Gloria did not like Liz. In fact, she hated her for good reasons. She thought Liz was manipulating Glenn and she was rude. She never paid rent. And she also didn't really seem to care for her son, Cody. 
On the night of January 28th, 1999, Liz called Glenn telling him to come home early because she had dropped Cody on the floor and he was acting weird. When Glenn got home, he found Cody acting fine and everybody continued on with their night. But the next day, Gloria found Cody to be oddly quiet and around 5 p.m. that night, Gloria found Cody not breathing. Gloria and Glenn immediately called 911 and the police took the baby to the hospital, but unfortunately, he ended up passing away that night. The cause of the baby's death was listed as shaken baby syndrome. When the police went to the family's house to question them over Cody's death, Glenn did state to the cops, also just remember he's mentally handicapped, that he occasionally would toss Cody into the air and catch him because that would make Cody laugh. Glenn did not think anything of it, you know, but he was, he was trying to think of like what could have harmed Cody. He was trying to help. He was trying to help. Yeah. So the police arrested Glenn for Cody's death and brought him in for questioning. Glenn's police questioning was actually really awful. They were basically using his mental state to try to convince him into admitting he had killed his son. What else was suspicious is that Cody's doctor, who ultimately had an autopsy done on Cody as well, stated that Cody had died after someone had vigorously shook him for over 20 seconds. So obviously, like, that didn't match up to what Glenn had been saying about tossing Cody up into the air. So shaken baby syndrome is a serious brain injury that babies can get from resulting from being forcefully shaken. It usually occurs when a parent or caregiver shakes a child in frustration or anger. This is usually because the kid won't stop crying. It's so, it's so sad, but it gives permanent brain damage. And in 40% of the case, like cases for shaken baby syndrome, it causes death. Another thing to mention too, is when a baby gets shaken it can have like the results can happen right away like that you can see signs or it could be hours or it could be days so just like keep that in the fact that it's not an immediate effect cody's case multiple people had seen cody leading up to the days of his death and that included liz glenn and gloria so it's possible that when liz called glenn that one night and said i dropped the baby and he's acting weird she could have been the one that shook him So after Cody's death, people noticed that Liz was not really acting normal or as a normal grieving mother would. She actually went on a binging shopping spree. And then the day before Cody's funeral, Liz convinced Glenn to have, quote, wild sex together, end quote. And then at Cody's funeral, people said that Liz was acting super cheerful and smiling the entire time. The police still ended up charging Glenn with Cody's death which is nuts, but they obviously needed somebody to blame. And Liz ended up taking the stand at Glenn's trial. This is just a random fact. I couldn't find anything else on it. But when she took the stand, she was wearing a blonde wig. Everybody said it had something to do with the fact that there was a warrant out for her arrest for car theft. There's literally no other information on this. So I was like, wait, tell me about the car theft. Got to draw them off the track somehow. Makes no sense. So... When she was on the stand, Liz ended up trying to pin the blame on Gloria, Glenn's mom, saying that Gloria had admitted to her that she had shaken Cody. But the biggest blow to Glenn's defense was when Liz produced a bunch of letters stating that Glenn had written these to her from jail. Glenn obviously said he didn't write. In these letters, it said that Liz had nothing to do with Cody's death and that Glenn loved Liz and he had done this to have a forever with her, which... This is completely nuts because if you remember me saying he had a learning disability and Glenn actually couldn't write. So there was no way he could have written these letters. From prison? Is that what they're saying? Yes. I feel like there Um, should be some way to look at if he actually sent them, you know, like through their system. The people didn't do their due diligence on these cases. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, why was he being charged anyways? But of course the court did not challenge the evidence. And Glenn was so in love with Liz and wrapped around his finger because no one had ever loved him before that he decided to plead guilty to the crime. Mm. And just like that, Liz walked out of the courtroom that day, a free woman and ended up never speaking to Glenn or Gloria again. That's really messed up. Down the road, Liz actually ended up having two more children, a daughter and a son. Her son's father was Liz's ex-boyfriend, Dirk. Dirk had actually broken up with Liz because she was obsessive, controlling, and insanely jealous. Doesn't that sound familiar? 
And after their breakup, Dirk began dating a new woman and Liz started stalking him and the new woman. She would constantly call Dirk when he was with his new girlfriend. She would show up at his place. And one time she even keyed the girlfriend's car. There were a few times where Liz even texted the girlfriend nude and sexual photos of her and Dirk to try to make her jealous and break up with him. But it even got worse. The girlfriend at the time was working as a pharmacy tech and Liz began taking classes to become a pharmacy tech as well. Liz even dyed her hair the same color as the girlfriend and got extensions so that their hair matched. She bought the exact same car that the girlfriend had, opened up credit cards in the girlfriend's name, and then told other people that her name was no longer Liz, but Melissa, which is the girlfriend's name. You want Melissa? I'll give you Melissa. (laughs) And this is prior to all of our our case happening. Right. So later on, Liz began dating a man named Garrett. And at some point, Garrett thought Liz was cheating on him because she had become distant and cold. But it turns out Liz was cheating on Garrett every Wednesday with a man named no other than Dave Krupa. So Liz told Garrett she was working, but in reality, she was spending every Wednesday with Dave. Like the whole time she was doing this shit with Dave, she had a boyfriend. I forgot about this part. And it is, how did she have the time? This is nuts. So poor Garrett didn't find out the truth until like years later too. This is crazy. And Dave never wanted anything serious, which is hilarious because Liz ended up having a boyfriend. At some point, Liz moved in with Garrett, but instead of sleeping together in the same room, Liz took the basement, kept it to herself and wouldn't let Garrett down there. So she basically became like, what's the people that move in that like aren't allowed to- Squatter. She was a squatter in his basement. Wait, Garrett, she had her own house this whole time, too? Yes. Yeah. Goodness. Garrett quickly noticed how Liz no, no longer acted like a girlfriend, but more like a roommate. Liz also, at the same time, stated that she was a housekeeper with her own business, but anytime she was out of the house, Garrett would sneak into the basement and find it filled with trash, leftover rotting food, etc. Liz never paid rent, and Garrett would have kicked her out, but... He didn't want her kids to become homeless, so he let them stay in the basement. Okay, so back to our main story. We don't really know how much evidence the police had against Liz at the time, but they did know that from the phone dump that Liz was pretending to be Carrie. They did have the evidence that Liz was a stalker as well. They just needed to find the proof that Liz did in fact have something to do with Carrie's disappearance. So remember the mint tin that was found in Carrie's car that had the solo fingerprint on it? two new detectives that were taking on the case decided to have another look at it. And they ended up comparing the fingerprint to a print they had gotten from Liz and it matched up. So on December 11th, the detectives placed a tracker on Liz's car and they set it up so that anytime Liz drove by Amy's house, it would send them alerts. Over the next few days, the detectives received multiple alerts. And on December 14th, the detectives called Liz for an interview to see if they could trick her into giving them some more information. When Liz came in, the detectives told her that they had found Carrie's remains. At this point, Liz began acting confused, but said that she had only met Carrie once and claimed that Carrie had called her a bitch while the two passed each other in Dave's doorway. Liz continued to say that she believed Amy was behind all of this. The detectives went along with it because they were like trying to get as much information as possible. So they were like, if Amy's crazy enough to stalk Dave, then she's probably like crazy enough to have shot you too. So there was like a whole facade that took place and they were kind of trying to just trick Liz into believing she had control. The police said that they needed Liz's help to collect more evidence against Amy. And of course, Liz agreed to help. Four days after their interview, Liz forwarded the police an email she had gotten from Amy. In that email, it said Amy was responsible for shooting Liz and to keep her away from Dave. But the detectives went on to say that they needed more information about Carrie's death and not the shooting. So they asked if Liz would push Amy for information. And sure enough, on December 20th, Liz magically received another email from Amy's. And when the detectives read it, they found a confession. So the email said the following. Quote, when I met crazy Carrie, she would not stop talking about Dave and him being her husband. She tried to attack me, but I attacked her with a knife back. I stabbed her three or four times in the chest and stomach. Then I took her out and I burned her. And then I stuffed her body in a garbage bag filled with crap. 
She was carried out to the dumpster, probably when Dave took out my garbage for me, end quote. The detective's plan against Liz was working, and over the next few weeks, Liz kept showing them emails that were arriving from Amy, but Liz was starting to get frustrated that Amy was not being arrested. So in late January 2016, David actually called one of the detectives and said that Liz had told him Amy was the one stalking them, and that Amy had actually murdered Carrie, shot Liz in the leg, and burned down Liz's house. The detectives decided to visit Dave at work, and that's when they told him the truth that they had been investigating Liz for months and they had the evidence that she was the one in fact doing all of these things. The detectives also warned, warned Dave that Liz was highly dangerous and to avoid her at all costs, which as you can imagine is a pretty big shock for Dave. You know, like he felt bad for her this whole time. It was like trying to help her. Crazy Liz. It wasn't crazy Carrie. It was crazy Liz. Dave decided to move in with Amy and the kids while awaiting the next steps on the investigation. On February 1st, Liz called the detectives crying and screaming that Amy had not been arrested yet and she was starting to get desperate, but the detectives continued to tell her that they still needed more evidence against Amy before they could arrest her, and of course, Liz provided this to them. She gave the detectives access to her emails, and later that same day, the detectives watched as multiple emails popped up from Liz's device from Amy. Liz was basically just playing right into their plan. In one of the emails, Amy mentioned a yin-yang tattoo that Carrie had on her groin area. This was a detail that was never released publicly. The emails also revealed that Carrie's murder had actually taken place in her own car. So the detectives jumped into action and went back to Carrie's car to search for more evidence. It was at this point that investigators took off the carpet of the car and the seat covers, and they discovered a large red blood stain all over the passenger seat. You remember how there was a little, little tiny pink stain and they were like, oh, it's just, it's makeup or something. Mm -hmm. After running tests, it was confirmed that the blood was indeed Carrie's. On February 1st, Dave frantically called 911 after someone threw a rock through Amy's window. Police were able to use their tracker to confirm it was Liz. So the police arrested her. Liz actually pled guilty and paid the fine, and so she was released. Four days later, while Liz was at work, the police searched her apartment and took any and all electronic devices that they could find, which included multiple phones that were all under Liz's name. The police also found and collected two of Carrie's cameras that were found inside Liz's apartment as well. That same day, the police arrested Liz at work for an unpaid traffic violation that she had open. While at the station, a detective walked Liz into an interview room and told her that he wanted to talk to her about a missing persons case. I've never been around her car. I've never even seen it. She definitely was giving me the old evil eye. She was upset. You could tell by being confronted. For years and years, people have been um, sending emails on her Carrie's fictitious accounts. The IP addresses show up to whose house? Your house. I haven't had internet at my house. You definitely see a woman who thinks she's smarter than the police, who doesn't recognize that she's in a mousetrap. Are you going to sit in this chair and be remorseful? Are you going to sit in this chair and be cold blooded? Because right now, after four years, this, this man is going to for answers. Detective Schneider then confronts Liz and tells her he knows that she wrote the so-called Amy confession emails. Why would you create all these emails? I haven't created any emails. All these have been coming from your, from no, your house. And I'm not going to be accused of something that I didn't do. Liz is the type of person where it could be 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you could tell her, Liz, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And she would say, no, it's not. It's midnight. The finger's pointing right at you. And I'm done talking, and I'm going to have my attorney, because I didn't do anything. Guys, she doesn't have internet at her house. It can't be her. Right? I like the part that she said, uh, or he said, it could be two o'clock in the afternoon. She'd tell you it's not. Remember, she's in there for a traffic violation ticket. So Liz's defense attorney paid for the ticket and she was released from jail. But finally, on December 22nd, 2016, Liz was arrested for the murder of Carrie Farver. Liz waived her rights to a jury trial at her preliminary hearing. So this means a judge would be the one that decides whether or not Liz was guilty, not a jury. Her trial date was set to May 10th, so the detectives really had to jump on their investigation and gather all the evidence they could. Fortunately, they received some help because on February 1st, 
Dave called the investigators to say that he found a tablet that the investigators had missed during their initial searches. When the detectives went through the tablet, they found an SD card that had once been in Liz's personal cell phone. When a forensic specialist examined the SD card, he saw a strange picture that had been deleted from Liz's original phone. This photo was of someone's tattooed and decomposing foot. Liz's mother, Nancy, was contacted and asked to turn in any photos that she had that would clearly show her daughter's feet. And when she did, detectives were able to match the two photos. Liz had killed Carrie and had taken a picture of her foot as some sort of trophy. They also found pictures of Carrie's yin yang tattoo that Amy had supposedly written down in her emails to Liz. This was the evidence that the detectives needed to move forward with Liz's trial. So on May 10th, 2016, Liz was charged with first-degree murder and second-degree arson. The prosecution argued that Liz confronted Carrie as she was leaving Dave's apartment four years ago for work, stabbing her repeatedly in the chest. Afterwards, she took photos of Carrie's body before she burned it and get, got rid of it. After that, Liz cleaned up the car and went on to pretend for years to be Carrie in order to cover up for her crimes. All of this stemmed from a jealous rage that Liz had over Carrie and Dave's short relationship. Because if you remember, Carrie and Dave had only, they only saw each other for a few weeks before this all happened. Liz had spent years tormenting and stalking Dave, Amy, and Carrie's family for her own satisfaction. In the end, Liz had sent over 50,000 text messages to her victims. And that's like not including emails. That's just text. It was estimated that she spent around 50 hours a week stalking and harassing everyone. During the trial, the prosecutors were able to produce photos of a burned tarp that was found in Liz's camera roll, which was assumed to have held Carrie's body while it was being burned. Liz's boyfriend, Garrett, also testified that he distinctly remembers Liz smelling like smoke in the fall or winter of 2012. This is right when Carrie went missing. And Gary vividly remembers this because that's such a weird, weird detail to remember. But he remembers this because he couldn't get the smell out of his house, which I'm like, uh, that makes, yep, that makes sense. Um, I would be pissed. Yes, of your squatter in the basement. So one of the other sad things from this trial is that Amy read out one of Liz's emails that had the description of Carrie's murder. This said how Carrie had begged her to let her talk to her family before she had died, especially her son, Max. It broke Carrie's family in knowing even more that these were her final moments before Liz brutally murdered her. When it was the defense's turn at trial, they tried to argue that there was no proof Carrie had actually been murdered since a body was never found, and that all of the evidence the prosecutors brought was just circumstantial, and a judge couldn't convict Liz on circumstantial evidence. Liz's attorney said that Liz was on trial for murder, not harassment. They could prove Liz was a stalker, but they couldn't prove she was a murderer. Fortunately, the judge was not convinced by the defense's case, and on May 24, 2017, Liz was found guilty of first-degree murder and second-degree arson. She was sentenced to life in prison. As she was being taken out of the courtroom, Liz showed no remorse or emotions. Liz is currently serving her life sentence at the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women in York, Nebraska. In late 2017, Liz's attorney received anonymous email threatening Liz's children's lives. As you can imagine, it was most likely Liz who sent these emails from a contraband phone while in prison. While in prison, a detective visited to speak with a different inmate, and that inmate brought up Liz, stating that she was insane. Apparently, Liz demanded that all of the other inmates call her Carrie. Liz even filed an appeal in 2018 to have her convictions overturned, but it was denied. And that is the story of the disappearance and murder of Carrie Farber. What a Dude. crazy bitch. Dude, is that not nuts? Years. It is. So, like, if you remember, to Carrie was, she disappeared and was killed, now that we know, in November of 2012. Liz didn't go to prison until 2017. Y'all, that's crazy. The police really dropped the ball on this one. They really they badly. fucked it up, didn't they? I'm just still amazed that she had all this time to do all of this, have two boyfriends. Right? Two boyfriends. She didn't have a housekeeping gig. She said she had her own business. She didn't. She was doing this full time. Like, we're, I don't even understand. Love makes you do crazy things. Dude, obsessed. I feel like we're starting a little saga of crazy ex-girlfriends because in my story last week, we're on a crazy ex era here. I know. I love I it. It's good or not. Okay. Good. Love it. <laughs> yeah. I like when they all, I like themes. I like themes. 
And with that, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. If you want even more information, including photos of the case, you can check us out on our blog at OverMyDeadPod.com. Be sure to leave us a review wherever you're listening to this. Check us out on social media at Over My Dead Pod, and we will see you next week with another case. Bye. 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 You guys want to jump right into overtime? Yes. No. All right, you guys. I want to publicly acknowledge and apologize to Miss Holly Spear here. After last week's recording, I had a few people reach out to me personally and tell me to stop picking on Holly and to start stop calling her out for all the things she does not know, like um, Mancoon cats, you know, and I don't even remember what the other thing was. But anyways, so I'm sorry, Holly. This is my apology. I will try to not do it anymore, but there's no promises. Thank you, Kate. I um I do accept your apology. I am thankful that you finally acknowledged how rude you are. <laughs> yeah, you're such a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So thank you for everyone that has shown me love during this hard time of me being bullied. But if you guys want to bully her even more, check out our social media pages at <laughs> Over My Dead Pod. <laughs> I love it. Someone yeah. loves me out there. Thank I you. will I will also say this was another thing that got brought up in the people telling me they were also got no compliments. They only were telling me things we needed to change. People don't want to hear about the rap battles anymore. Anyways, I have a presentation for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Why is he on our screen? <laughs> for the listeners, I have a picture of P. Diddy on the screen. Because, you know, when the whole raids were happening and people were like, Oh, his jets flying out of the country, he's going somewhere where he's not gonna be like extradited, it got me thinking. Who has no extradition with the U.S.? And where would I go? You know what I mean? Wait, the listeners cannot see this, but for overtime, Kylie literally has a PowerPoint pulled up right now of countries with no U.S. extradition treaty and where would I go? There's only 20, but I picked seven that I heard of before. A lot of them I had never heard of. Didn't know they were real countries, but I picked seven. An analysis and competition in honor of Memorial Day. Oh, I figured, like, I'll go through. I have pros and cons for each one. I'll pick my favorite. You guys, like, pick yours. First country we have is China. For pros, I put good food. You know, for example, P.F. Chang's, Panda Express, Benihana. Love those. Right? Those are not from China. They'll be there, for sure. They'll they'll be there. there. (laughs) They'll be there. Also, I mean, I don't know about Holly, but at least me and Kate, we would be considered tall there, and I feel like we would have a good chance at going pro in basketball in China. Cons. COVID. 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 Oh my God. We're going to get fucking canceled for this overtime. All right. No to China. Next. Algeria. Oh dear God. Pro is that you could swim to Europe. In parentheses, better. No, you can't. Oh my God. It's right there. Looks Cons. I honestly hadn't heard much of Algeria. Apparently it's not a very nice, safe place and the internet's really bad. Podcasting would be very difficult there. Yeah. Afghanistan? What? So we wouldn't have to drive or get a job, guys. But you Han, can't go outside. Han, we aren't allowed to because of the Taliban. <laughs> this and is, we probably couldn't have a podcast. This is the worst presentation I've seen. Shut the fuck up. I think it's good. Why are we okay? Next, not Afghanistan. Armenia. Hmm. Oh, okay. I want to go there. Kardashians. No, that's not. Share. You know, oh my god. <laughs> Apparently, oldest winery. I know Kate's allergic to wine, but like me and Holly love it. Con. Apparently, their sewage system is so old it backs up all the time, and you can't really flush anything. So you kind of got to go in the bucket. So dumb. Yeah, I can do it. This is so dumb. No, we're not going to Armenia next. You gotta pick one. Next, Morocco. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pros and cons. Give them to me. Pro, you could also swim to Europe. That's not... Oh, my God. Okay. Good food. I've had Moroccan food. Can't pronounce any of it. Can't remember any of it. But I remember it being good. According to Google, white people, like tourists and stuff, you need security. That's. It depends on where in Morocco. I've had okay. study abroad groups go to Morocco before from my university. And some of them loved it, but they could only stay in one town particularly. So... Yeah, apparently pickpocketing and is a big thing Huge. there. Yeah. Colombia. Nope. 
it's not that far away. We're still technically in the Americas. I did less the second pro, but I will not be saying that out loud. Cons, we have the cartel. Cons, we would also be considered ugly in comparison to Colombian women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is Colombia in contention? No. Okay. What about Ukraine? Not right now. A con, there is a war going on, but pros, Chernobyl, we love Chernobyl. That's not a pro. And they love American people. Okay. See, I want to go where I'm loved. Yeah. Exactly. I would, I Ukraine really would be good it. if it was not now, not right now. Hopefully we don't have to flee the country anytime soon. Maybe things will be resolved by then. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. And that is in my presentation. I've decided I'm going to go to the Ukraine. Yeah. Ukraine would be the best out of that list that you just gave us, but not at the moment. I'm thinking Colombia or Ukraine. Yeah, and you I, would you would die in Colombia, Holly. What what's so wrong with Armenia? I feel like Armenia is fine. I don't hear anything about them. Yeah, it's just where they're bordered to. Okay, I want to go to Armenia. That's where you can find me. Okay. So I'm going to Armenia. Kylie's going to Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah. And Kate's going to Ukraine. I'm probably staying in the U.S. You're going to go to jail. Kate's going to prison. Go to prison. Okay. You you'd rather go to prison than go to Chernobyl. You'll find me in. Probably causes to honor something. I don't know. I'll be in one of those places that Kylie's never heard of. Hey, you thrive in Armenia. You kind of look Armenian. Both y'all do. You do. That was hilarious. That was great. Catch us there. Bye, listeners. <laughs>